friends, and welcome to this episode of the Astrology University podcast and the Cosmic Eye forecast for cancer season. Thanks so much for joining us. And Vanessa Montgomery is here with me to help lead us into cancer season. Thanks for joining me, Vanessa. Hey, Tony. Thanks for having me. Hey, everyone. Welcome to cancer season. As I said last year, the mighty crustacean. (laughs) So... Let's talk about cancer season. Of course, it's very exciting because you guys in the Northern Hemisphere, it means it's the beginning of the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, which is always something to celebrate. And traditionally, it seems with a bonfire, (laughs) if you can manage it. So of course, cancer the crab is personal cardinal water. So the beginning of a season, which is summer or winter, depending where you live, it um, moves to initiate the cardinal uh, emotional connection connections it's water so if you've noticed a few extra cancers pushing out in your life you know there's been a couple of planets going through cancer already so it's kind of feels like it started early to me anyway so in Sweden I did a little bit of googling and in Sweden um, there's a national holiday for midsummer they love it that much which I thought was great. In Iceland, the sun, it's 24-hour days. The sun doesn't go down in midsummer. If you Google that, it is so beautiful. Like I actually cried a little bit when I saw it. It was so beautiful. I was having a look last night. Um, Of course, Stonehenge was built for this moment. You know, it's a big moment once a year. And um, other monoliths as well. There's the Gate of the Sun in Bolivia. So uh, when the sun is at that perfect point, the light streams through, you know, an opening just to mark it. So I feel, and I would say I care because no one cares like cancer cares. They really do never underestimate that beautiful caring quality. So ruled by the moon, uh, at the height of the sun, interestingly, uh, represented by the mother or the child, pregnancy, babies, a theme of course is nourishing and comfort food, (laughs) comfort wear as well. So I've got my tracksuit on today because I just associate cancer with, you know, nice, soft, velvety, velury comfort on the couch kind of wear. It's very clannish, you know, family oriented. So I always like to take the moment to also remind people that's chosen families as well. Those people that their family, you know, they're in your life forever and you did actually get to choose them. So that's awesome. You know, and, and making that mix because it's clannish like Scotland. It's that that big, larger family. And um, I think of, yeah, gangs, like that's a little bit Scorpio in a way, but also cancer. It's very water sort of like pooling together. And I've got my girl gang from the early 90s has just reformed strangely. So I'm thinking early, early manifestation of cancer season childhood nostalgia you know the u.s is ruled by cancer with the sun in cancer and what i noticed from afar is very nostalgic and very really responds to that nostalgic element and um yeah just sort of looking back through that soft lens at how good things used to be (laughs) and cancers can often be like that as well so through this month it's a nice time to actually look back I think and have your own nostalgic moments and reconnect with that you know it's it's really there's a reconnection thing that goes on I think with cancer as well as Taurus that continuity and reflecting you know the moon the ruler is does reflect light so it's a good time to get back and reflect and see where you are now and bring things together so it's less um, compartmentalized I think is a nice way of using this energy Um, very accepting and loyal. And, you know, the opposite, of course, is Capricorn. So there's a business, it is a business axis. And I think people forget that about cancer, you know, in the old days, the big houses, that was a small economy right there. And that's that cancer side, small business where you have to run all of that. And cancers are canny. You know, they are canny. And um, you think of uh, Richard Branson, very successful cancer. It's very canny. So we'll get to him under classic signs. So uh, any any cancer notes from you, Tony? Oh, that was just a, a great lead in. So, um, I mean, you know, we could talk about, uh, I love how you brought up the food, but I think of like farm food because there's comfort food that's like Taurus comfort food, you know, that's a little bit different than mm. cancer comfort food. And I know a lot of cancers yes. who really like the 
the more kind of comforty, almost bland foods like milk and eggs and, you know, farm food. Yes. And I also like this phrase, cooking is caring for cancer. Yes. What I've noticed, I don't know if you've noticed, well, you've noticed that sort of farm kind of food, like that simple home cooking, like yeah. it's, yeah, but it's also really, it's very wholesome. And again, it's that from years past. And it's interesting you say the farm, because I was thinking about the American Midwest farm, like that's set up as well. Also kind of touristy. So yeah, a food that I've noticed is spaghetti bolognese, cancers, just that's the one, that's the go-to. It's so wholesome and hearty, but simple. And my cousin that I live with, who is my a major cancer study because she's got everything in cancer, she couldn't believe recently that I've never had spaghetti bolognese. She's like, but what about when you moved out of home? I'm like, no, I was ve- I've been vegetarian since, you know, beginning of grade 11, you know, that was in 1987. She just kept asking because she couldn't, she just couldn't compute. And so she's like, I am going to make you vegan spaghetti bolognese. Like you can't miss out. So my everything in cancer cousin, just pre-cancer season made it for me and was really yummy. (laughs) She feels like, yeah, one of her life things is it's done. She could not let me go further into this life without that. So get you vegan spaghetti bolognese on for cancer season. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) So let's go into classic science. Who's your classic cancer, Tony? Yeah, mine is uh, Tom Hanks, uh, an actor who's known known for his warm and accessible persona. Many of his characters have that soft interior and the sensitive nature that tugs at our heartstrings. A lot of his characters have that even his voiceover character from Toy Story, um, Woody, you know. Family is really important to Tom Hanks. And he once said, I married into a classic old world family structure in which people like to spend time with each other. That hadn't been part of my existence up until then. And now I can't imagine it any way, any other way. And this next one is another quote from him that is just perfectly Cancerian. And he says, um, because we didn't talk about this much, but, you know, cancer can correlate with nationalism as well. And he says, I'm not apolitical. I'm very specific in my politics, but a lot of the time it's nobody's business unless you're over at my house having dinner. (laughs) So I love that one. Um, And then some other uh, classic cancers include Ariana Grande, who has a class, a classic cancer thing for teddy bears. Um, I have a story about that. Maybe I'll tell sometime. Marianne Williamson, Missy Elliott, and Tom Cruise. And who's yours uh, for today, Vanessa? Oh, I was thinking of Ariana too. So soft. It's a very feminine sign, isn't it? Very, yeah. And um, so mine is, I'm going with, there's a look. There is a look for cancer. And so I'm going with Margot Robbie, but I'm going to just say a couple of other people that I think have that look is Jessica Simpson was the one that I really noticed. And my cancer friend that got me into studying astrology properly pointed that out. And I think she's correct. There's like this round cheek. It's very beautiful. It's like I, when I see it, I'm I'm just like that person's a cancer or that, that woman, the guys I can't pick as well, but women I can. And another one is busy Phillips. They're all, you know, American. I don't know if you've heard of her, She's been in lots of movies. They've all got this certain look. And it's like Tom Hanks in that they don't, they're not there to rub you up the wrong way. They're they're definitely not confrontational. They want to make this nice feeling. They want to do things that bring us all together and we feel relaxed enough to let our guard down and start getting emotionally connected. Like I feel like that's their role. And then, yeah, they're not here to sort of push you to find your edge they're here to relax you. So I think a lot of what they put out is is done in a way that gets that going and gets that, yeah, everyone connected like the clan. It's not about separating. It's about bringing together and pooling as, you know, the water signs generally all three tend to do, going for that emotional connection. So uh, Margot Robbie, I also chose her because she's uh, local. She's from the Gold Coast (laughs) up the road. (laughs) My like ex-girlfriend's dad's family live next door to her growing up. Like it's all very local. And I think there's the girl next door and she's got that look. And I think it's really interesting what she's doing now. It shows that, you know, in that Richard Branson way, you know, cancers can create empires and she's in with three other people now in her own production company. She's still under 30, I think. And it's very much focused at, you know, finding and creating 
strong roles for women. So her, it would be interesting to hear her talk about it more because I'd say she's, it's going to be in a nurturing way. She's got this little family vibe. I think one of the girls in the production company is a friend from her youth from the Gold Coast or from Australia, you know, they're extremely loyal and they create their community and go forward with that. So a quote I have from Margot Robbie is, uh, being irrational and out of control is what happens in real life, not cautiously choreographing your anger or your emotions. Losing yourself in them is what happens in real life. So there's her quote about feelings and you know I think a lot of the water signs have probably done quite well in acting because they can express that quality and Margot obviously does that you know there's an emotional thing that helps you feel emotionally connected to them as well yeah so that was mine so let's go through to the monthly moons so this month we've got of course the full moon in opposite sign of Capricorn, and that's happening on June 24th at 2.40 p.m. It's going to be at three degrees Capricorn, so quite early on in the game. It's going to be trine Jupiter, so it's a bit of a good news full moon. Trine Jupiter, which is in Pisces, just to open things up and um, feel good. There's lots of sextiles and trines on that day as well. Meanwhile, you know, T-square Uranus and Saturn um, with Mars at the apex, I think it is is happening. So there's tension, but with the moon itself, it's all it's all good. It's all good. So plan something for that day. Get together something where you know you can um, looking for a connection with people. A nice plan a dinner with comfort food. Like go for it. Why not? That's quite nice. And so the opposite, of course, Capricorn's about boundaries. It's about structure. And then cancer is putting the juice into that and the heart into it. You know, it's a bit dry just with rules and structure, isn't it? So then we have the new moon in cancer is at 18 degrees cancer on the 9th of July, July 9 at 9.16 p.m. I think that's Eastern time. It's trine Neptune, very nice. However, this one may be a little bit more... Uh, tense or challenging because it's in a T-square with Chiron and Pluto. Perhaps at that time, just look at um, maybe what feelings are coming up, maybe anything from the past or in uh, your circle or relationship, anything that's tense along perhaps along those lines. And um, obviously don't get caught up in it, but take some sort of detachment and deal with it or just deal with that part of you that maybe needs some healing. Uh, Maybe it's not the best time to have your group dinner, (laughs) save that for the full moon for sure. And all the energies around that full moon, maybe it's a bit more of a a private moment here. All right. Well, (laughs) give me the headlines. What's happening this month? What are the key signatures? Sure thing. Well, the big aspect all year is still Saturn and Aquarius square square, uh, Uranus and Taurus. And I've been saying that every month because it still is. Uh, We just had a second, the second exact pass of this aspect on June 14th. And we'll get one more of those in December, but it's in range all year long. Tune in, tune into our YouTube channel for a short video where I talk about this square and share a few tips and talk about the rising interest in cryptocurrency in the context of that square. Um, so I won't repeat what I've been saying each month uh, this month, but head over to YouTube and check that out. I am uh, trying to record a couple of short videos each week. So if you'd like those, uh, please click the like button on those and also subscribe to our channel. And that lets YouTube know that you would like to see more and I will notice that and I will keep doing them. (laughs) So thanks for that in advance. Um, uh, But some more big news this month is Mercury Stations Direct on June 23rd in Gemini. Now you'll probably want uh, to hear that Mercury's in Gemini, it's in a sign that it's rules. So as it stations direct, it's full steam ahead with anything mercurial you've had on hold, like important communications, for instance. The thing is that whenever Mercury stations direct, um, people want to be like, oh, Mercury's direct, go for it. But Mercury's standing still. So in order to really full feel, feel that speed picking up with Mercury, you need Mercury to pick up speed first, right? It may still feel a bit sluggish and slow in terms of some of those topics. 
Uh, but uh, Mercury is past the conjunction with the sun and it's moving into its new phase uh, of relationship with the sun. It's ready to move forward with its new mission, so to speak, its new Mercury mission. It is, it does, it does have a feeling of, of newness and promise and possibility, but more importantly, Mercury is still in range of the square with Neptune which has made this Mercury retrograde cycle a pretty memorable one. You may have noticed some kind of quintessential Mercury retrograde experiences, which you may have heard me say this before, I feel are usually more attributable to the Mercury-Neptune aspects, like the one we've had this time with the square. As Mercury goes direct, it's going to move into one more direct pass of that square with Neptune on July 6th, so the fun isn't quite over. Mercury-Neptune aspects are wonderful for poetry and fantasy writing, sci-fi, so if that's your thing, you're in luck right now, and you've got a couple more weeks to make the most of this potential. If you haven't already, get to it, <laughs> because it's a wonderful aspect for that, but if you've been seeking clarity or you've been trying to make sense of things, or you need some rationality in the mix, or doing some data mining and uh, trying to get some facts, Neptune has been presenting just a few challenges. You might think you have the facts and then you find out later, gosh, that was really off track. <laughs> because Neptune is trying to take you somewhere else. Neptune is trying to take you out of the rational zone. We have to make effort with squares, and the effort here could have to do with integrating intuition and divine inspiration, Neptune territory, with the Mercury and Gemini's penchant for matter-of-fact, rational thought. Again, that's why it works so well for sci-fi. <laughs> Not as much for real life, <laughs> um, but it's excellent for the dream world um, and fantasy. Mercury goes into Cancer on July 12th. Well, that doesn't help us out if you're looking for that rational fix either, because that's going to turn the volume up on the subjective experience with Mercury. This is an imaginative feeling-based Mercury in which you could, can, you know, at worst, convince yourself that what you feel is the truth, even if it doesn't look like that to others objectively, right? But we have to imagine that there's some gift in that, there's some reason in that, some purpose in it. And so I just feel that you're meant to tune into that subjective experience with Mercury in Cancer and that that's where the, that's where the growth lies. Jupiter stations retrograde on June 21st. This is important because Jupiter is still in Pisces for most of this month. And when a slower moving planet stations, it really kind of constellates that energy. It's kind of like an exclamation point for several days there uh, at whatever degree it's stationing. So uh, make the most of this opening up energy that's come with Jupiter and Pisces. And of course, I'm referring to opening up after this COVID lockdown experience. Uh, also the optimism, the hope for growth and connection, the hope for new connection, the hope for prosperity. Uh, you can really tap into all of these energies right now. Make the most of it now because Jupiter's going to retrograde back into Aquarius on July 29th. So that's in uh, Leo season. So we'll talk about that one more next month. But tap into that Jupiter and Pisces vibe now. Uh, on July 1st, Mars is going to oppose Saturn and then a couple of days later come into an exact square with Uranus. So really in that whole range of July 1st to July 3rd, we have a T-square energy with Mars and Saturn and Uranus. This is a pretty uh, fiery, feisty T-square. and it's a T-square energy, as you, as I was saying earlier, squares always require work, and this particular square has a, a bit of a dramatic feel. However, it is short in duration, uh, but there could be some fireworks on these days. I'm going to focus in here on the Mars opposite Saturn piece, and in, in that part of it, your frustrations might get the best of you especially if this aspect is important in your chart. And this could be you if you have planets around that Leo Aquarius axis around 12 degrees. If you're dead set on getting what you want, tenacity might be called for. You might need to face a challenge with either courage or maturity or both. With fixity prominent here, you might also need to stand your ground or you just might find yourself digging in your heels <laughs> and refusing to budge on your position, which could just lead to more frustration. So notice if in this dynamic, you're playing the role of Mars, the aggressor, or if you're on the Saturn side of the opposition and you're setting up a roadblock or a limit against something. A great question here could be, 
is this really worth fighting for? Or what's the wise decision here? To stand your ground or to back down uh, for now or to save your strength? These are all good questions to uh, ponder. There's no easy answer in this dynamic. Uh, it's just something you're going to have to wrestle with. Like I said, the good news is it's pretty short. It's going to last for just a few days. What Uranus is doing here is throwing in a monkey wrench into the dynamics, a little bit of unexpected dynamism, but also a little bit of potential for insight and uh, and liberation, right? So there could be this the Saturn Uranus energy that we've been wrestling with all year, Mars comes in and and turns on the volume, turns up the volume on that story, right? So if you've been following along with our podcast and we're talking about, let's say for instance, this dy dynamic tension between the old and the new, right? Mars comes in and, and kind of like pokes the beehive <laughs> and says, hey, um, you look stupid, you're honest. <laughs> I'm just being silly here. It's the end of a long week. But uh, what I'm saying here is that Mars is a faster moving planet. And when a faster moving planet comes in to one of these longer aspects, they act as a trigger. And what kind of trigger do you think Mars is? Mars isn't like a soft, warm hug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Vanessa just showed me the fist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mars is like, hey, bring it on. Let's do this. Yeah. So, um, you know, sparks could fly around these days. And with all that fixity, again, I just want to say uh, it might not be the easiest time to make progress. And you're going to have to choose do I want to sort of um, try to push against all that fixity? to get my way or do I want to wait a few days and sit this one out? Right. So that's going to be up to you. And I'm not, you know, we can't really tell using astrology, what's the right choice for you, but, um, but we can see that there, that that choice is, is in the mix. Um, by the second week of July, as Mars moves out of that configuration, tension will have softened a bit. And then eventually Mars is going to move on uh, to get inside this, Mars Saturn piece of it, Nancy Grace, a former prosecutor and television host of Court TV, has a natal Mars Saturn aspect in her chart, along with the moon in Cancer. And she says, to suggest that you can't be both a mother who's completely in love with her babies and a professional who's tough and tenacious is ridiculous. I love that uh, quote for speaking to those dynamics in her chart and brought in a little bit of the Cancer vibe too. But thinking about what tenacious means and also what somebody who describes himself as tenacious might have been through to get to that description of themselves. If you're tenacious, you've probably had the experience of having hit that brick wall of Saturn limitations, obstacles, roadblocks, but you didn't back down. Tenacious people don't give up at the first sign of an obstacle in their path. So if you live with that aspect in your chart, that's a quality that is uh, is there for you to develop. But you also might need it during this upcoming transit. <laughs> All right. So on July 8th, uh, Venus comes into the square with Uranus sparking things up in term in the in the Venus realm. Not going to say too much about that one because I have a lot more to say today, but Vanessa, do you have any kind of favorite tidbits about Venus and Uranus coming into aspect with each other? Well, yeah, they're a square, so <laughs> I expect the unexpected with relationships. You know, I expect some, a surprise from someone that's close to you. Uh, don't get a haircut unless you want something, you know, you're leaving with something that you totally didn't think would happen or you were going for something really unusual. I'd still do that under a try. <laughs> possibly a conjunction just for the wild card yeah I think um it's always interesting when Uranus is involved it's definitely something noticeable because it's so sudden could be a little shock Venus oh sorry Leo to Taurus I guess it's looking at that and again it's that fixed quality which I think is generally the hardest to work with because it's fixed and it doesn't want the movement <laughs> You know, it's interesting to talk to Leo. Like I ask Leos about that that fixed quality just to get it straight from the lion's mouth. And yeah, they they literally say have said, Yeah, it's my way. I know what I want and I want it my way. So <laughs> so does Taurus. Guess what? Yeah. <laughs> News just in. So does Taurus. And if you think about that fixed quality of those two signs, who's gonna budge? Probably neither. So uh, look at where they are for you in your chart. Obviously, if they're taking in any of your natal planets, it's going to be uh, more a story that's, you know, a theme in your life and it's just going to 
kick that off. As you know, Tony was saying about the Mars thing, it's just, it's going to be that little prod to that <laughs> beehive that's already sitting there. So beautiful. Thanks for that. Yeah. I, I like the comment about, we were talking about Venus before we started recording today. Vanessa and I both have Venus strongly configured with our ascendants and we were talking about hair. <laughs> so I love that. Hair makeup. <laughs> I, know, I, know. I love that example of the, the haircut. And I think asymmetry with Venus and Uranus too. So you might come yes, out. With, absolutely. If asymmetry is what you're going for, maybe it's a good day <laughs> for a haircut. <laughs> but if you're going for an even cut, maybe not the best day. Yeah. Okay. So uh, all kidding aside, July 15th, Chiron stations retrograde at 12 degrees of Aries. So if you're having your Chiron return and your natal Chiron is at 11, 12, or 13 degrees of Aries, you've kind of signed up for a little bit of extra credit with this one. You might get some clarity around what your Chiron return is about on these dates, because Chiron is just going to hang out at that degree for all of July and August. Some Chiron themes that can pop up are mentoring others. This is an issue that can take on center stage. We always talk about the wound and the healing with Chiron, but I like to, to turn up the volume on that mentoring correlation because it's, it's, uh, it's a strong one, especially if you're having your Chiron return, because Theoretically, you've lived with your natal Chiron, whatever that's about in your chart for a good, you know, 50 years or so. And you've hopefully done some, some healing work around that. And you might have a gift to give back, right? So the Chiron return can signal a time when you're ready to start um, helping others, maybe sometimes with the same thing that you needed help with and maybe something else that you have some wisdom around. On the other hand, uh, any Chiron transit can spark or, or ignite or, or correlate with a healing process that needs to unfold in which you're called to be present with the process rather than having a take a pill to fix it approach. That's not Chiron, right? So uh, we just have this one ingress this month to highlight, and that's Venus moving into Leo on June 27th. So uh, mark that one down. It's time to turn up the glitz and sparkle on your Leo. Uh, get your, what do they call those? Uh, your bedazzlers out. <laughs> and does anybody still use bedazzlers, Vanessa? Uh, I like to think so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Get your cape on. <laughs> turn it turn up the volume it's like they again you know the seasons feel like they come in a bit earlier when venus or mercury or whichever planets are preceding the sun through that sign don't they so it's going to be be a bit more razzle dazzle to cancer season than say if venus was in cancer so i'm looking forward to it i love a little bit of food dazzler sparkle arkle Yes, I love Venus and Leo. Uh, so warm. Yeah. And it's definitely got a stepping out and uh, stepping into some presence energy after being in, in cancer. So that's a great one. Well, now we have come to the declination report and we've just come through a really strong out of bounds period where we've had several planets out of bounds at once in the last month and two month, two month period, basically. So I just wanted to put a call out. I'd love to hear any stories from folks from the last month especially um, look for this theme. Have you had like a random idea? Maybe you're just getting clear that that idea was more random than you thought it was at the time, <laughs> but random ideas in the last month or two that seemed really fun or compelling at the time or uh, a, a new direction that you wanted to go in. But now they start, they're starting to seem like, hmm, that's, that really came from out of left field, or it seems ungrounded now that Venus, Mercury, and Mars are all back in the more average part of their declination cycle or on their way there. Venus was the last one to come out of its peak declination on June 19th. Uh, and actually, as we're recording this today, it's June 18th, so we're not quite there yet. But when I release this, Venus will have come uh, back down. Uh, so I would say give it another week or so and let me know if, if you have stories like that. I would love to hear them. I kind of collect them. So drop me a line at Tony at astrologyuniversity.com. I'd love to hear from you. The moon is going out of bounds every month right now this year. So those dates are going to be June 24th to 26th. Uh, as always, when the moon is out of bounds, you just want to notice your emotional responses 
because when a planet's out of bounds, it can have a bit more of an extreme response. And so if using astrology, we can kind of mark those dates and those could be good times to be with your emotions, to be present with your emotions, to process your emotions in healthy ways, and to, to be careful about just unleashing your emotions on the unsuspecting partner <laughs> or a good friend. Uh, yeah. Parallel aspects. I like to talk about those as well. Uh, parallel aspects and declination can be interpreted like conjunctions. They're especially important when they coincide with conjunctions. And we've got a big one of those this month. Those are conjunctions. They're the most important, right? So when a, a planets are conjunct and parallel, it's the strongest aspect between two planets. On June 23rd, we have Venus parallel Pluto, uh, well, not conjunct, so it's just a parallel. So it's a little bit of a Venus-Pluto conjunction vibe on June 23rd to 25th. I'm not going to say a lot about that one. On June 23rd, we have Moon parallel Pluto. On a, Also on June 23rd, we have Moon parallel Venus parallel Pluto. On June 29th, we have uh, Mercury parallel Mars. Again, those two are not conjunct or an aspect. And then June 13th to 25th, we have Mercury parallel Pluto. And in between that, on June 24th and 25th, Mercury and Pluto will be op opposite each other. So you will get a pretty strong Mercury opposite Pluto vibe on the 24th and 25th because they're going to be under um, uh, heightened or expanded on by that uh, parallel between Mercury and Pluto. You know, Mercury Pluto aspect is a doorway to exploring uh, the the underworld a little bit. This is a very quick aspect. It might be a good time for journaling about something in in your past that you want to heal or work on, something that you already know about, right? Um, it it takes usually a Pluto transit, like a slower moving Pluto transit, to unearth something from your unconscious, but. Uh, when Mercury is transiting Pluto, you have an opportunity to to go into some of that material because. Let's be honest, if any of you have experienced that, you can work on healing it for your whole life. <laughs> you can do little bits and little bits, right? And this could be a really good date to, to tap into some of that material and think about it or write about it. Mercury things, right? On July 2nd to 8th, we have Mars parallel Saturn. Now, we were talking about Mars and Saturn earlier, right? And that July 2nd is uh, we've got an additional emphasis on the Mars Saturn aspect. So July 2nd, that July 1st, the third is, is, is pretty, is a uh, pretty strong. Maybe it might be the kind of the peak aspect date, uh, this month. Uh, what do you think, Vanessa? I think so. And I have to just go back to what you said before about <laughs> trying to unleash things onto people close to you. And I'm thinking all online and that, that saying that people write, looked cute might delete later except Probably i don't think it. i don't think we're going to say looked cute on this one <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh yes don't put it online no but just you know yeah. those days that's what's interesting about the yeah the out of bounds stuff so i know that's going back to what we were talking about but i think that's it's definitely good to note i noticed a lot of that with the last out of bounds well we've yes. done it but yeah things just it's so extreme so just remember it's like things are, they feel they, they don't, they're not contained. They do spill over. So just be aware of that. Let it spill, but not publicly. <laughs> yes, for sure. Demetria George shared a, a funny thing with me about these moments uh, where, when she's looking at transits to her own chart that triggers something in her chart and where she uh, puts tape over her keyboard. I don't think she literally does this, but she's like, I'm going to need to put tape over my keyboard so that I don't use it on those days. And then I just, you know, yes. process it myself and then share later when the, when the heat has, has cooled off a bit. On July 13th to 17th, we have Venus parallel Mars parallel Uranus. So it's kind of like a triple conjunction of Venus, Mars, and Uranus. Uh, so remember, I was talking earlier, those are the dates when just it's just after when Venus makes that square with Uranus. So it's another, it's going to extend that Venus Uranus vibe, but it's, Mars is going to jump in there a little bit. And the moon jumps in there as well on the 13th. Uh, so July 13th would be another date to kind of notice and mark in your calendar. Be a bit careful around uh, July 12th to 15th, Venus is conjunct Mars. It's not an aspect to uh, Uranus on those dates. And now it's time for our nonprofit break. And each month we feature a nonprofit on our podcast that we support 
with a donation and that we also encourage you to support. And this month, our featured nonprofit is Sea Shepherd, to whom we make a monthly contribution. Sea Shepherd is an international nonprofit marine conservation organization that engages in direct action campaigns to defend wildlife and conserve and protect the world's oceans from illegal exploitation and environmental destruction. Now, you may have had a window onto some of that in the recent documentary, Sea Spiracy, which has been on Netflix. Pretty disturbing one. I do recommend watching it if you don't know about some of these issues uh, or if you think you need any convincing about how important uh, this issue of protecting our, our oceans and the life in it uh, really is. So we hope you'll join us in donating this month at seashepherd.org. That's S-E-A-S-H-E-P-H-E-R-D dot O-R-G. All right. And that brings us to our Opportunity Knox section. So let's talk about uh, Venus trine Neptune on June 20th and 21st, Mercury trine Jupiter, July 11th and 12th, and that Mercury-Mars conjunction I talked about. So beginning with Venus trine Neptune on June 20th and 21st, this is a Venus trine Neptune always has a really romantically idealistic energy. And in the trine, it's a real sweet love connection where we can tap into that experience of higher love, whatever that means for you. So whatever your spiritual concepts are, it's a good time to, if you have a spiritual devotional practice, it's a really wonderful time for that bhakti kind of practice, if you know what that means. And if you don't, uh, and you just have a devotional uh, spiritual practice that involves love. <laughs> That's what we're talking about here is turn up the volume on love uh, on June 20th and 21st while Venus is trying Neptune. That's probably going to be the days that we release this uh, podcast. So um, I hope you get the message on that one. Anything you want to add to that Venus trying Neptune vibe, Vanessa? Oh, just that, yeah, that's a really nice time to, if anything is really tipped out of the can during those out of bound times or whatever, this is a very nice day to mend those bridges. You know, there's always the clean up after the spill. So it's, I think it's really worthwhile choosing these days uh, under the opportunity knock section to do the uh, damage control, put out those spot fires, clean up those oil spills, you know, because, they, you know, they, I think that relationships do require a certain amount of maintenance and there's often those check-in times. So why not choose times where things are more supportive of that emotional connectivity as well as the walls or, you know, barriers down so that you can reach through? Yeah, that's a great point. I love that point about Venus trying Neptune to use that energy to reconnect with those you feel close to that you may have uh, had a little bit of friction with recently. <laughs> Definitely to uh, reignite that love vibe. And, you know, if that's a, a person you're in a relationship with, these could be great date nights, but uh, you could use the same energy with friends, with chosen family, as Vanessa was saying earlier, uh, just to create that, uh, just to be with people you love and to share love and appreciation with them. So if you get that feeling, uh, definitely share it. Yeah, uh, the synergy is about sharing. On July 11th and 12th, Mercury is trying Jupiter. And I'm going to talk about that one in just a minute. And this is one of our opportunity transits this month that we could use for an electional. So I'll speak to that in just a moment. But I mentioned earlier Venus conjunct in parallel Mars on July 13th. Venus and Mars coming together is a, it's a really, some, some astrologers will describe it as like a sexy energy. And they say that because it's like our, our attraction nature and our desire nature come together and uh, Richard Tarnas has this lovely way of describing Venus and Mars to get coming together as a kiss, right? So it takes Venus and Mars to make a kiss happen because the kiss is about a connection, which Venus is going for, but Mars is making the connection happen. Yeah, I'd say it's um, because it's in Leo as well. I mean, it's very showy, isn't it? It's very, you know, I see Leo and Mars or Venus in Leo. There's swagger involved here. So, you know, if you want to make your mark and you want to be, there is that sexy component if you think of the sexy rock stars. You know, they swagger around. There's a sexiness. There's a sex appeal that's really raw. Like, And I agree, it does take Venus and Mars. There's you have to have the receptivity and the desire because imagine just Mars without that. So yeah, it's nice, nice for connectivity and showing off or really making a statement as well in a way that's also smooth and looks great. Like get your rock star on that day. 
Yeah, it was. It, it makes me think of a conversation I was having on YouTube uh, on my Venus Out of Bounds video I posted last week, and a fellow was talking about uh, a lady friend that he's had for many years, and he's kind of starting. To, he's want, he's feeling like he'd like to maybe try to take that relationship into a more romantic territory, but he's feeling nervous about it. And uh, this might be if I told him to kind of sit with it for a little bit, because if it's been a few years, a couple more weeks, isn't going to, isn't going to hurt. Right. And to, and to think about how he might approach the conversation. And if you're listening out there, July 13th might be a great day to just kind of go for it. And uh, and say what you want. And Leo, you know, people don't talk about this a lot, but Leo requires, we'd always talk about courage with Mars and Aries, but um, Leo requires a fair amount of courage as well, but it's because they need courage to face the fear of rejection, right? So you may be feeling some of those fears come up as well with Venus and Mars in Leo, and you might need to kind of push through your stage fright to get out there and do your thing. As I said earlier, uh, my days for electionals include this window on July 11th, and this is after 1.36 p.m. Pacific time when uh, Mercury goes into Cancer and forms the trine with Jupiter. If you remember, Jupiter is in early degrees of Pisces. I believe it's at one degrees. So when Mercury's at, as soon as Mercury hits zero, it's, it's in sign in that trine with Jupiter, you could take advantage of that for an electional. You just maybe want to choose Gemini, Virgo, Sag, or Pisces rising if possible to capture the, the strongest potential of that particular aspect. On July 13th and 14th, we have uh, some nice potentials as well. And also on July 21st, as long as you take action before 3.27 p.m. Um, I'm stating these dates for people who know a fair amount of astrology and can kind of seek out the best ascendant and all that, because there are better and worse times on those days. Now, these are all dates that are part of the waxing moon part of the cycle. So they're good for things that you'd like to grow. Um, you'll notice we have a few more days this month than we've had recently, which is good news. Uh, so we have a few more electional choices this month. Well, that brings us to what's on your coffee table. So what are you reading right now, Vanessa? Well, I am, I've been down to the library. I'm getting into the library lately and just seeing, you know, it's, it's like a lucky dip. I just walk in and see what pops out. That's quite fun. It's called When We Become Strangers, How Loneliness Leaks Into Our Lives and What We Can Do About It by Maggie Hamilton. And it seems a bit depressing, I know, but I've wanted to read a book about loneliness for a while and this one's hot off the press. So it actually takes into account that COVID was last year and it brings all of that in. There's a lot, obviously, about screens digital devices and that separation that that's caused, what it does to your brain. I love the statistics. So there's all these statistics in there that I'm quite enjoying. And I know it's not an astrology book, but it's so essential to remember that, you know, you can apply your astrology. So, you know, she said a date of 2011 and I'm thinking, well, what happened around then? Neptune went into Pisces, like, you know, apply the astrology to um, real life and, you know, what's happening now with the digital. Why is that? If we look at it astrologically, why is there a loneliness thing? How could you uh, explain that through the astrology that's happening now? How then you, could you flip to the other side and, um, you know, make the most of it rather than be a victim of it? So I'm finding it really interesting. And a big thing she said, obviously in the beginning is touch is so essential. And what's that? It's Taurus, but Uranus is in Taurus. So there is like this detachment as well. It's an interesting way to go about your astrology. So that's always being applied as I read through these things. And I'm just finding it really interesting. You know, and there's lots of positives. What can we do about it at the end? Yeah. Well, what about you, Tony? What are you reading? Well, I haven't had any time to read this month, especially since I started making more YouTube videos. <laughs> so I'm going to mention a book that's in my to read stack that I just got, and it's called Looking for Lorraine by Imani Perry. I'm really excited about this book. It's a book about Lorraine Hansberry, uh, and I can't wait to read it. It's Lorraine Hansberry is someone who we have a good birth time for. So I'm hoping and I'm hoping to do more work with her chart in the future as part of our four year program. And I like to, I just love digging in deep into people's biographies. And she has such a fascinating story in life. So I cannot wait to, to dig into that one. Uh, well, what are your takeaways for this month? I'm going for, as usual, the vibe of the season, the solar season. So for cancer, keep in touch with what you're feeling. 
Uh, but let those feelings flow and change because, you know, that's the moon associated with cancer. So it's very changeable. Let them flow and change and that's okay. Feelings are meant to change. So that's my takeaway. It's pretty simple, but feel your feelings. <laughs> a lot of us don't, you know, a lot of us medicate them and that so, seems so encouraged by our culture, unfortunately. But uh, if you feel them earlier on and deal with them, it's much easier than when the dam builds up and then you just basically get flooded and overwhelmed. So get in there, get in there and swim around. What about you? Uh, mine's pretty short and simple today too. Uh, even though we have those couple of hot spots this month or this cancer season, uh, my advice is to just enjoy this beginner beginning of summer vibe that's unfolding in the context of the optimism that's a part of Jupiter and Pisces. Uh, keep things slow and easy. Spend time with your chosen family to honor some of the cancer vibes. Uh, and for a month. <laughs> Thank you. And then for monthly mantras, uh, do you have a mantra for us this month, Vanessa? I do. I've got a couple. So I easily feel a sense of deep security, love, nurturing, nourishment in every area of my life. You know, that Cancerian nourishment and security. And I easily cultivate and maintain a community of like minded souls that give me a sense of belonging. <sighs> it's a nice foundation for life, isn't it? You know, and cancer associated with the fourth house. That foundation is so, so, so essential. You know, if the trees to grow, you know, externally, it's it's not going to work if you have no roots. So get those roots established and cultivate them and maintain them and spend enough time at home and with those people that know you well. Like I think of in Hollywood, how people just lose it because the roots are gone. They've got nothing to come back to and to ground themselves in. And people that seem to main, be successful with success, navigate successfulness successfully, are people that have that often that family around them or people that know them and treat them like normal, like not like the famous person, but as who they really are. Otherwise, they lose a sense of self. So that's something to uh, remember. And you, Tony, what's your monthly mantra? Well, awesome. Th that last bit actually just reminded me of Tom Hanks because I was just reading a little bit about him before we started our podcast today. And that sounds like exactly what he does. Uh, so he, I guess he's being a good cancer. <laughs> um, my yeah, mantra exactly. And modeling, modeling. Yeah. My mantra is I honor my own subjective experience by sharing my feelings and holding caring and nurturing space for others. And I say that one because there's a way in which sometimes we can downplay subjective experience. Like we might say, oh, that's just all in your head or you're just imagining that, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z person. I think about uh, my two sisters and one's a Scorpio and one's a Cancer. And they, I mean, this is a common experience in all families, but they have very different memories of certain events in childhood and my Scorpio sister likes to say to my cancer sister, that's all in your head. That never happened. But there's a way in which if it is your experience, even if it is truly subjective, even if we could watch a movie of whatever that is my sisters were talking about, and we could say, actually, that didn't happen. <laughs> um, but for the for my sister, who's the cancer, she did feel like it happened. And there's something important about that. If you've ever done therapy, it's important to honor those experiences that were meaningful to you because they, you know, they, because of how you felt about them, even if they were literally happened or not. Right. So honor your subjective experience uh, is my advice there. Um, well, that brings us to the end of today's podcast, unless you want to add anything to that, Vanessa. I just want to uh, support your motion on that one, which it's true, you know, that, that, and that's why I think the yin signs get a lot of flack because our society is so geared towards the yang and the rational, but um, the fact is we're half the other side too. It's so important and there's no one reality. It's true. You know, people say, well, prove it. There's nothing provable. Like we can, um, with our psyche or whatever it is, manipulate machinery and computers like there's no such thing as just one truth and one way so I really like that you said that and it's a great month to uh, even work out what is our experience and where that line is between someone else's and be okay with that mm. definitely I love that well, uh, at Astrology University this month, I'll tell you about a few things coming up on June 26th, 2021. Mark Jones presents 
a new webinar in his aspects series, if you've been tuning into that one. Uh, and in this time, he's going to explore the nature of the opposition. Mark is weaving in insights from Dane Rudyard, in addition to extensive research on well-known charts that he does with his research assistant, and also many charts from his own counseling practice, all into an amazing information packed and inspiring webinar series. He's done uh, the square and the quincunx so far, so now he's doing the opposition. People have just been loving the series, giving Mark tons of positive feedback. So tune in and find out what all the fuss is about. On July 3rd, I'm going to be giving uh, probably my favorite uh, webinar that I've prepared all year. This one's called Trickster Mercury, Hoaxes, Parodies, and Lies. Uh, I've been reading a wonderful book about uh, the trickster archetype by Lewis Hyde this year, and I uh, went down kind of a research rabbit hole with this one and found a few correlations as I was look, actually doing some research for my Mercury Out of Bounds work, and in that process, I came upon this aspect that shows up over and over and over again in the charts of people who participate in famous hoaxes and parodies and people who, let's just say, have been caught in some dramatic lies. <laughs> Mercury is the planet of communication, thought, perception, and reasoning. And when it's working well, Mercury helps us understand, helps us get clarity, helps us spread and disseminate information, or to bring objectivity to bear on a situation. But the deities associated with the Mercury archetype in myth were also tricksters who delighted in bending the truth. <laughs> and in this talk, we're going to review a few jaw-dropping stories of hoaxes, imposters, lies, and parodies that reveal this trickster side of Mercury in great detail. So join me to find out which aspects of Mercury placements stand out in these stories. And in true Mercury fashion, we're going to set our judgment aside for the most part and instead just revel in the delight of these amazing tales. And the really big news I want to share with you is that on July 13th, we're going to be opening our bundle registration for our four-year program. We do this only once a year for about six weeks. If you've been waiting on the sidelines, now will be the time to sign up. So mark your calendar, July 13th to August 30th is the open period for a bundle registration. And a bundle registration is a time of year where we sell, you commit to nine courses in, uh, in our program. So you commit to one year's worth of study and you get a discount for making that commitment. So you get to save, uh, you get nine courses for the price of eight. So it's a really sweet deal. And we, we do allow people to join our for your program at any time during the year and work through the courses a la carte. Uh, but if you want to join with a live cohort of students who are kind of working through the material at the same time, it's, it's a chance to participate in wonderful community building that happens as part of our for your program that students rave about. Um, now would be the time to kind of check that out. Uh, so if you have any questions about it, email us at help at astrology university.com. You can head over to astrologyuniversity.com forward slash program to learn more. And we'll also be on social media over the summer to talk about it. So watch out for those where you'll be able to just join me for a live Q&A session. So thanks for joining us today. And thank you so much for joining us, Vanessa. And we wish you all a very warm and cuddly cancer season. <laughs> <laughs> yes, cuddle, give a few extra cuddles out and get a few extra cuddles. Like, don't be afraid to ask. And it's initiating sign, it's cardinal, initiate those cuddles. I like that you mentioned the C word, the cuddles. <laughs> Definitely. All right. Well, uh, take good care, everybody. And we'll see you next month for uh, Leo season. Bye, everyone. Stay cosmic. <laughs>